gracious Heavenly Father, we praise you for the privilege and the opportunity that's ours to gather together and worship you. We just ask again that the Holy Spirit might take this hour and strip away the foolishness and the error, but seal to our hearts that which is truth. Father, we recognize that we are handling the infinite Word of God, the Word of the Sovereign God. And we are keenly aware of our limitations. And more than that, we're aware of the energy of our enemy. We'd ask that the Holy Spirit might open our eyes, our hearts, to understand the truth of your word. Open our hearts, our eyes, and teach us truth where we know there is no other teacher but you. And these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com And we're studying together uh, in the first epistle of John, verse by verse. And in our last study together, we, we had come to the end of chapter 3, and so we're look, beginning to look at the, the first few verses of chapter 4. First John, chapter 4. Of, uh, of the three chapters that we've been looking at, uh, we've seen the supremacy of the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the truths that are contained in this marvelous epistle just really bless our, our hearts and encourage us and strengthen us in our walk with the Lord. If, if there are any words that we ought to use to define the gospel, then it... it it would be the finished work of Jesus Christ. Paul declared that he preached Christ. And when he labored in Corinth for 18 months, he taught them the Word of God. He taught them the Word of God concerning the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And of course, the, the question the question that, that now faces really all of professing Christendom is, is did Christ die for every human being or, or did he do that for his own? And in several of our studies, I pointed out to you that, that 400 years ago, the unanimous theological position of professing Christianity was that Jesus Christ died for his own. And in doing that, he presented them holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. And I, I suppose what I would ask just about every Christian that I meet in this present time that we're living is, is how often do you, are you taught that from the pulpit? So in the last 400 years, it's, it's really absolutely astounding what has happened to the Christian concept of biblical theology. Because, you know, no longer is it, is it the unanimous opinion that Jesus Christ died for his own, but it's virtually the unanimous opinion that Jesus Christ died for every man. And, and, and that is, that's made effective when, you know, somebody personally accepts Christ. 
you know, with his own mind and his own reasoning, you know, he decided that he didn't want to go to hell. You know, he wanted, he wanted to go to heaven. And so he accepted Christ. You know, in the morning or the, that time before he, he accepted Christ, he was headed for hell. And then on the afternoon or the evening of that day that he accepted Christ, well, he was headed now for heaven. And dearly beloved, uh, you know, that's basically today's the concept of Christianity today. I don't know how many of you might agree with such a concept. I don't know who all watches these videos. I know those of you who have followed this channel, you know that that is not the position of this ministry. Uh, but you would have an enormous difficulty with the Word of God if that's what you actually believed. The natural man cannot please God. He's absolutely unable to do so. Unable. He has no ability. You know, with what did the man accept Christ with? Well, it was the new man. It was the new man that accepted Christ. It wasn't the old man. The flesh cannot, cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. Now, we're talking about the Spirit of God. And in our present study, we're going to be looking at the opposition to that. The natural man cannot please God. Why do you not hear what I said? Said our Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 8. Well, because you cannot, you cannot hear my word. So how then do you hear? Well, you hear with new ears. How do you believe? Well, you believe with a new mind. And how do you live? You live with a new heart. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind, in your mind, by the wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled, God reconciled, in the body of his flesh by means of death. When did he reconcile you? When did he do that? When he died. You know, where could you possibly, possibly read in that text that he did it when you believed? You know, when you accepted. You know, when you walked down an aisle, when you shook someone's hand, when you received, when you repented, you know, when you were baptized or, or whatever, whatever else, or anything else. He did that, he reconciled you when he died by means of his death in your place, in your place, a substitutionary death. And what was the result of his death in your place? What was the result? It was to present you holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. And that's how you stand before God today as a new creation in Christ. A new creation in Christ created in righteousness and true holiness. Folks, no wonder it is called the finished work of Jesus Christ. And so it is with this understanding. In fact, it's, it's as I study these, these verses, it's with that all of that understanding that I've come to understand through numerous epistles, New Testament epistles. Not just Paul's teaching, but John's as well that we're told not to believe every spirit. We know that God has given us of His Holy Spirit, but we are not to believe every spirit 
but we are to try the spirits whether they are of God. Of God. Okay? Now, uh, we've got some, some patches, uh, some We've got some passages in the New Testament alone. Uh, 20, maybe, perhaps, or more. Uh, 20 some odd uh, passages just in the New Testament alone, commanding us to be aware of false prophets, false teachers. We're told that we're to test every spirit, every single one, whether they are from God. And if Scripture is any basis, and it should be, and I, could, I believe that we can confidently say that most of the preaching that you hear, most of it, is false. That shouldn't surprise us. I don't, think, I don't see how that, that should surprise any Christian. You know, Jeremiah speaking truth when everybody else is not. You know, Elijah on Mount Carmel. You know, one man, one man, against 400 prophets of Baal. And the scriptures declare, God's word declares that we, dearly beloved, are the filth and the offscouring of that legal world system, that legalistic world system, that world system that's based on human merit. You know, we don't build big churches. We don't have huge followings. And, and folks, I don't think that this is any casual comment, okay, by the Holy Spirit. Try the spirits. Test them, okay, whether they are of God. And how would we do that? Well, the only way that we can do that is by God's Word. We are to try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many, many, and that's a big word in the Greek, many false prophets have gone out. It's a perfect tense. They've gone out. Perfect tense. And it's, it, that perfect tense is stressing the reality that they went out in past time with the result being that they still have, are going out. And they are present. It stresses the reality that the reality that they're there. We they are there. We are commanded to put them to the test to make sure that they are of God, and that that of God that is a phrase that you will see repeated through the next I don't, eight verses or so of this chapter as we begin chapter four. You'll notice it's almost almost one. It's mentioned one time, almost once in every single verse. Of God, we see that repeated over and over. Of God, of God, of God. Well, we know it's God's Spirit that confesses or agrees with God that Jesus Christ has come in flesh. You can get rid of the definite article there. It's not there uh, in the original text. If you have it there in your translation, well, it's it's only because the translators have added it. He he didn't come in the flesh. He came in flesh. Okay, and that is a perfect tense. There's a very important use of the perfect tense. I've, I've talked about this a lot. We've seen a lot of that here, right here in, in this epistle in First John. There's a very important use of the perfect tense. Not only has Jesus come in flesh, I mean, that's what the perfect tense is saying. We have a God man sitting on the throne in heaven today. Our mediator. You know, the man Christ Jesus. We have a God-man sitting on the throne. Well, you say, well, that's that's kind of, uh, that's some kind of a spiritual body, you know. Folks, in flesh, Touch me and see, says Christ. The Spirit does not have flesh and bone as ye see me to have. Christ came, was manifest in flesh, and remains in flesh. He's God of very God. 
but he's also man of very man. Every spirit that confesses, that is, says the same thing as God. That's what the word confess means. Homologeo. That Jesus Christ has come in flesh is of God. So please take note of all of, of the of God's mentioned here in the first eight verses or so. I believe I counted eight. There may be more. So we've got a whole bunch of of God's or from God in our context. Jesus Christ is the one, folks, who spoke the worlds into existence. He's the Jehovah of the Old Testament. He's the one who, who thundered the law from Mount Sinai. You know, the same one, the same one who said to the woman taken in adultery, go and sin no more. Neither do I condemn you. You know, he's God of very God. And he is supremely, supremely sovereign. Okay? And he became flesh. We didn't ask him to. We didn't expect him to. We had no we had no concept of his plan, his overall plan of redemption. He became flesh. He died in our place. And he rose again. And he rose again because because we're justified, we're made righteous. He was delivered because of our offenses, okay? You didn't ask Him to be delivered because of your offenses. He was delivered because of your offenses. He was delivered because of our offenses. And He was raised again because we are justified. Did you know, dearly beloved, that you stand before God as righteous as His Son? Clearly, the only conclusion that you can reach is that our justification was the result of His death in our place. And because that was sufficient, sufficient, nothing to be added to, He was able to rise from the dead. Therefore, having been justified by faithfulness. Whose faithfulness? Yours? No. Christ's faithfulness. We have peace with God. I mean, where is any human will in that? Well, there isn't any. It is not in man, folks, to direct his steps. And we are here being commanded, commanded to test the spirits, whether they be of God. It's only fitting that we would be asked, or not asked, but commanded to test the spirits, whether they be of God, after seeing everything that we've seen in the first three chapters. The Spirit of God tells me He knows the way I take because He laid it out. And when he's tested me, I shall come forth as gold. Not because, well, not because I do a good job, because I turn out to be good, you know, and you're not. <coughs> no. You're not quite as good as I am, you know. No, every single one of you for whom Christ died will come forth as gold, okay? I didn't say that, he did. You know, uh, I'll, tell, I'll tell Christians, I'll say, well, 10,000 years from now, nobody will be in hell that should have been in heaven. And, and uh, that makes them mad. Why? Why would it? Why would that make them mad? 
You know, imagine the concept, folks, of a God, okay, a sovereign God who spoke the worlds into existence, okay, sitting up there and saying, you know, I'd like those people, you know, I'd love it if those people would be in heaven, but, but I mean, if those Chris, if those people, if they don't, if they don't do whatever, okay, if they don't, and especially if they, these Christians, if they don't do a good job, well, I guess they'll just have to go to hell. And, you know, it, it may sound so ridiculous to, to me and to you and, and to others, but folks, that's the modern popular opinion, okay? That is, that's, that's the, today, in the age that we live in. When you say Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, or in flesh, okay, you are confessing all that he is and all that he did when he died in your place. Please take note, okay? I mean, the devils believe in tremble. Just because you believe God, you know, may have become man, okay, doesn't, doesn't mean that you're born of God. He died for us in our place. Who pair is, is in the Greek. In our place. You can do anything with a word, okay, that you want. But you can't do anything with the Greek word who pair. He died as your substitute. Okay? He died in your place. And as a result, you can't die. And that ought to be great news. Good news to every single one of God's children. Every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in flesh is not of God. And so God's people are the, mon the minority, okay? We're the minority. And those spirits which are not speaking God's truth are there because God is sovereign, okay? God put them there so that you might try them. He put them there so that you might test them, okay? The chapter starts out with our being loved. Take a note of that, okay? God loves you. Those of you whom I love put these spirits to the test. God wants you to study. I mean, how can you put these spirits to the test if you don't study to show yourself approved? A workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. How can you test them? By what measurement do you have to test them if it's not the word of God? If those spirits are not of God, well, you have one of two, of two conclusions, okay? Well, they snuck in there, and, and God didn't really want them there, okay? But they're there, but he didn't want them there. Or, the, or, or, or they're there by God's design. And I tell you that if you think, if you think that they snuck you in around God, okay, well then folks, we are worlds apart in our theology. <coughs> Still trying to get over this cold. They're there, folks, so that, okay, you might be scarred and bruised in battle and come forth as gold. But what they teach is not of God. They're not teaching you God's truth. But, the, but they are there. They are there by God's design that you might test them, okay? That you might put them to the test and, and come forth as gold. This is the spirit of Antichrist. You know, John already mentioned that in the second chapter. John's the great proponent of love. 
You know, you're going to see a lot of love in this in this epistle. And and particularly this this first epistle of John. You know, and the idea is today is we all, we just got to love everybody. You know. Well, you'll notice that the heart of this epistle, okay? That that deals with with love is inseparably connected with the spirit of antichrist you are not counseled to love the spirit of antichrist okay but if you ask the the common person on the street if you stop just about anybody that you know professes to be a believer you stop them on the street or you, you come up, walk up to them after church or whatever, and, and you just say, uh, what is the main characteristic of Christianity? Well, it's love everybody. Love everybody. You know, we don't care really as much about what anybody believes. We just, you know, doctrine, you know, that's divisive. You know, we just love everybody. And... And we're not critical of anybody, really. Well, I mean, well, actually, we are. You know, they won't say that, but but we ought to exalt that attribute of God. You know, that He loves everybody. You know, while ignoring His other attributes, marvelous attributes, important attributes like sovereignty and omniscience, you know, an omni, uh, omnipotence, omnipresence. Now we just got to love everybody. Ye are of God. Of God. You cannot take that verse to say, folks, you cannot take that verse to say, I am of God because I went down an aisle, I took somebody's hand, or I shook someone's hand, you know, or I agreed to, you know, I don't know, maybe I, I filled out the little, you know, membership little card in the church or whatever. And I, I took somebody's hand. I accepted Christ. I did everything that they, they told me to do. All of the cliches that are thrown around today that obscure the truth of the Word of God. Why are you not of God? Because you... Well, because you're not born of God. Why are you of God? Because you were born by the will of God. Why did you believe Him? You believed Him because you were already His. You were already His sheep. Okay? If you're not already His sheep, you cannot believe. John chapter 10. Folks, you're of God because God borns you, okay? I, you know, I, I don't know, it's probably not a right way of saying it, but you were born by the will of God. Has been born from God. It's a perfect passive, completely done, in past time, okay? Passive voice, all right? You didn't have anything to do with it. You are of God because you're His children. He begat you, okay? And He expects you to understand that He's your Father. You know, the first, first thing when you pray, Our Father who art in heaven, you, you, you acknowledge the fact that you were born of God, not, not according to the will of the flesh, not according to man. He's your Father. And as a father, he's the reason that you're in existence. You're his child. You're not his child because you chose to be his child. You're his child because you were born by the will of God. And we're looking at the spirit of the Antichrist that doesn't confess that Christ came in flesh, doesn't acknowledge who his person is and all that he did, his work that he did on our behalf. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. You've overcome, 
Okay? False spirits. Why? How? How have you done that? Because you are of God. You haven't overcome them because of, well, you know, I don't you your skill in in and or expertise in argumentation or your your skill in in the scriptures or 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 the your expertise in Greek or Hebrew or you know uh, you're just I don't know you memorize strongs backwards and forwards and folks I'm not saying that those are bad things those are great things those are tools that God has given us okay I, you know oh look you you can dig dig a ditch with a teaspoon but let me tell you it's much much easier with a backhoe. <coughs> and God has given us some wonderful tools. But the tools are not the reason that you overcame. Your intellect, your ingenuity, you know, your... I don't know, whatever your your pizzazz, whatever pizzazz you you possess, you know, that is not why you overcome them. You overcome them because you were born of God. There is no way, folks, no way that you are going to lose this battle. Look, I love you all, I truly do. Rest in him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.